took a little while to start recording. Hi guys, um, I'm taking a lot less time on social media these days. Um, my life has not been improved by it, so, and, you know, taking it back to a tool. Pardon me, I just moisturized my face, looks at, <laughs> all greasy, good stuff too. Mm, this stuff, highly recommend it. It's, uh, yeah, it's from Saskatchewan. Oh well. Anyway, doesn't matter. You probably weren't going to buy it. <laughs> if you want to, get a hold of me. I'll send you a link. Um, so one thing that I, that has, well, the thing that has perked me up and given me some direction in life again, um, is I'd like to challenge the LSATs. No, I don't want to challenge, I don't want to go to law school. I mean, I, I shouldn't say I don't want to go to law school. I don't expect to go to law school. That would be a better way to put it. It's possible, but it's, you know, way out there in the realm of, yeah, right. So that's not why I want to challenge the LSAT. Um, recently, I was accused of something that I wasn't doing and required to abrogate my Canadian rights and freedoms to prove that I wasn't doing it. As in, I was presumed guilty until I could prove otherwise. And anything I did to protect my rights was considered to be an admission of guilt. In fact, the situation is not completely resolved because I am refusing to give up my rights to make them feel comfortable. And this refusal is being taken as an admission of guilt. And I'm hiding something. This has me angrier and angrier with each passing day. What the heck are our use, use or our rights? If we're not allowed to use them when we need them. If the only time they're good is when we're standing up in front of a group of people talking about highfalutin ideas. When the rubber meets the road, that's when your rights are supposed to matter. And not just criminal. So... I have, as part of practicing for the LSAT, I have to, hmm, okay, I've been typing since I was 13. My handwriting, my handwriting is spastic, I get a lot of cramps, and uh, the LSAT is all pencil and paper all for three hours. <laughs> and so for me, challenging the LSAT is going to have as much to do with the mechanical skills of getting through it as anything to do with the um, intellectual skills. I mean, I, I can clearly see from a little bit of prep that the intellectual skills need my attention too. I'm going to have to learn what kind of reasoning it is that they're doing and I'm going to have to get the hang of doing it quickly enough to meet the time limits. Um, I don't know how people normally do on the LSATs. I don't know if people normally complete them. And I don't frankly care. My goal is to complete every single question and none of them with a random toss-off guess. None of them will be completed with a, I don't know, I'll just pick something. All of them will be, I think that's the right answer and I will answer all of them before the dinger goes off. That's my goal. Now that was how I played it in university too. I went into university and into university exams with the attitude that I have prepared myself and I have learned everything that I possibly can. I have done my best and at this point I nearly need to demonstrate that to the teacher. And then before I go in I make a little prayer. May I please have access to everything I know in order that I can do my best. And as a consequence it has been a successful university career. I got I got some crappy marks um, and I got some high marks, some really high marks in sciences in fact. Just the kind of stuff the law school wants. So my, 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 my uh, undergraduate degree is actually perfect for law school. My grades are good, if not very good, for law school. Um, my finances are no chance. Um, but I do have the advantage of being disabled, and transgender, and mature student, and an alumni. Now, these four things are, in point of fact, all four aces in the deck. Um, so... Here's my thought, my crazy thought, my, my hope thought, the dream thought, the thought that keeps me scribbling page after page of paper, of which I'm going to read you this in a bit because I really like the essay I wrote. 
I imagine in my head that there is a possibility that I score so highly on the LSAT, so flippin' high, that they want me enough to extend a full scholarship. I mean, it's only a year of online study. It's also possible I'll, by then that there will be a way to scare up the tuition. Because um, if I could get even just my JD, it's a year, it's online. It's, it's one year, half online, half in class. It's totally within my specs to do the courses. And if I could get that, I think I'd make a really good civic lawyer for ordinary people's needs. I don't want to be a criminal lawyer. Oh, I know, it's, it's all flashy and pretty, and I'd probably be all right at it, and I'd probably save some people's lives. But in point of fact, what happened to me recently was a civic matter, and had as powerful effect on my life as if I had been arrested, and had the potential to affect my life as radically as if I had been sent to jail. It had the potential to kick me out of my home, take from me my property, and leave me with nothing but crippling debt. As I say, it's not resolved. It's a difficult, stressful situation for me to face, and I think that it's about time. Um, well, not time. I think that it's necessary for there to be people like me out there to help people like me. You, the guy next door. Where do you go when you need to get your, when you, when you buy a house and you need to get things legally documented, legal documents put together? To whom do you go when you need notary public? To whom do you go when you need... Um, your, your passport signed. There's all these stupid little things that they do. And more. And I want to learn what that is, how to do it, and I want to provide it. Furthermore, this is going to be a genuine system source of, employ of, of income for me. Um, I can do lawyery stuff well up into my dotage, regardless of my physical fitness. It pays well enough that I don't have to do a lot of it if I'm willing to live a simple and humble lifestyle. Um, offers me, therefore, in that, because it pays well and because I have a simple lifestyle and, and simple desires, it also offers me a, fanatic, a, a fabulous amount of time space in which to give free and or affordable services to people. Now, my lawyer has always given me good service at a good price. Um, he lives in a ramshackle office, and he's old as old as as as, as Beelzebub himself. And I never thought twice about it. I thought that's his prices because he has low overhead, low expectations, and he wants to be this kind of lawyer to people. I was in his office talking to him about my matter recently, and he's utterly incapable of extending himself to assist me, and I am utterly incapable of paying him enough to make it worth his time, which is at this moment more valuable than usual. Um, and he explained why, and I, my heart goes out to him. I, I want to help my lawyer, not the other way around, you know? Mm, the best I could do was ask the mayor to look in on him, because that was the next person I called. Um, I messaged him through his campaign and said, hey, would you please call me? And being a friend of mine, he did. And the mayor called me. And I told him what I'd been going through. And I says, I know that this is not something you're going to be able to um, meddle with. It's not your place or your position. He said, but I think since you're the mayor now, you ought to know what's going on. He says, by the way, I'm not the only one getting treat getting gentrified out of existence. you got to go talk to Emmanuel Sonish. I'm sorry, pardon me. you got to go talk to my lawyer. Uh, I don't want to throw names around in this. This is an internet thing. Anyway, unless you're actually from here, you won't even figure out what that name was. Um, but he's... Hmm, his father actually had a street named after him in town. Okay. And he's the, um... He's the idealistic son. <laughs> Never really made good. <laughs> and yet did. Um, has a whole lot of respect from him. So I have to read you what I wrote. So, I, um... I'm practicing to communicate with the agent with whom I'm dealing right now on my matters. And I'm holding her off while I get a few loose ends tied up in order to um, have a firmer stance when I speak with her. And also to have um, stronger evidence of my intention to comply with civic directives, to be in compliance with civic bylaws, and to be an honest 
forthright, upstanding citizen of the city. So first I need to get a couple of details put together. Um, we're like this close. We're a, a dead carburetor away. <laughs> There's a vehicle in the way of another vehicle. It's a, like I said, it's a different story. So this is what I've written today as my writing practice. Because every day I practice writing. Um, either two pages or 20 minutes of... I will sit on the boogie board and I will write curly cues and random letters and alphabets and stuff. Just practicing my cursive um, for 20 minutes. Or I'll write two pages of cursive. And uh, I even dug out a pencil sharpener. I'm so glad I had one. I'm sure I did. And a good quality eraser. <laughs> so, this essay is about our rights and freedoms and what, why they matter at all walks of government. Privacy is dignity. It is a recognition of someone's agency as an adult. Taking privacy away is an understood form of abuse. We normally use it only on criminals and our enemies. Parents who abuse their children almost always begin with violations of this most basic right. It is included in every modern government as a basic right. City Hall justly reserves a right of way over homes and yards in the city for a very good reason. I am sure there is no need to elaborate. Now, at this point, I was still writing two. I was still practicing a letter two. And then after here, I decided, no, this is just a general essay, and I will be more specific when I write two. However, it must be tempered with not a little discretion, as the actions of civic matters can be as devastating as any criminal matter, sometimes more so. It is for this reason the process is complaint-driven in the hopes of tempering the law. It is not possible to draft a perfect law or even a reasonable one, because there are aspirate because these are aspirations for humans, not the common bent of saying. It is also not possible to avoid abuse of officers as the position is very attractive to such persons. It is for these reasons we create checks and balances in the system, including our char charter of rights and freedoms. It is the responsibility of all Canadians, not only officials, to uphold our charter. When a citizen's rights are being impinged, that citizen is obligated to resist and refuse. When fulfilling this obligation, one continues to own the right to be presumed honest, a.k.a. innocent, until there is clear evidence proving otherwise. When standing on one's rights becomes an admission of guilt, then the system breaks and trust and good faith are lost. Without these, we cannot effectively accomplish anything. Once that trust has been broken with a citizen, they will be uncooperative, argumentative, and more inclined to dishonesty out of sheer outrage. Civic politics are where people and government meet most closely. It is especially damaging in society when the trust is abused at this level. To repair the trust requires extra effort, respect, means, and patience, as well as a strict recognition of our collective rights is needed. And I would have written more, but I got to the end of the page, ran out of lines, and said, you know what? That's okay. It's my practice. You can see why I want to challenge the LSAT. At one point, I was given a lecture about how important it is as an adult to pay, pay for things. Presuming somehow that I was trying to get a free ride in life. And I, 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 as a disabled person, I've received that lecture far more often than I deserve it. The assumption that my lack of money indicates somehow a lack of character is rampant. The assumption that a lack of success indicates a lack of effort is rampant. The inability to see what it is that my op to see my obstacles from the outside does not justify the treatment of me as a lesser person. I am not lesser. I am not in any way lesser. We are all Canadian citizens and we are all equal. Now, I don't know if that's true in your country, but in my country, that's the law. We're all equal. In any where that we see inequality, we are expected and encouraged to root it out and fight against it. I was raised that way. I believe in that. I do that. That is my way. Now money gets in the way. Ego gets in the way. Pain, people's psychological pain gets in the way. People's triggers from when they were kids gets in the way. Lots of things gets in the way, but it doesn't change the importance of trying. I don't know where my life is leading, but I can tell you this. 
My inability to thrive has not been for want of effort. It has been for want of opportunity. And my want of opportunity has been caused by my inability to thrive, and I've been caught in a catch-22 since the very beginning. I was, as so many children are, absolutely thrust into the world with a negative mark that prevented me. And the moment I first started as an adult, I was already too damaged to qualify for adult citizenship in this country, in this society, I should say. As a country, yes. As a society, no. As a society, I was considered to be a lesser person already, simply because of the damage that had been done to me in my childhood and the disabilities with which I grew up. Now, the autism is partially to blame for the damage done to me, but the damage done was deliberate damage done by other human beings, let me tell you that, without question. It was people choosing to hurt me as much as they could, as often as they could, for as long as they could, specifically for the purpose of hurting me, because that pleased them. Seeing me hurt gave them pleasure. I don't get it either, but believe me, that's what was going on. And I'm not guessing, they've told me to my face on many occasions, because I'm the kind of person that gets right up in the bully and says, why are you bullying me? And the bully says, because I like it. I said, why do you like it? Because I hate you. Why do you hate you? Why do you hate me? Because you think you're so smart. I had that conversation, not just once. Whew. You can tell, you can tell because it's a trigger. Or dogs are getting rest. I do this thing. That's going to be my hardest thing if I do try to go to law school. Keeping my expression oatmeal bland. You know, keeping a bland enough expression for all of the poor frightened people in the audience who think I'm going to suddenly explode in dynamite or something because I'm having a loud moment. <laughs> but it's oratory. Oratory speaks loud. People didn't used to use microphones, you know. <laughs> so, what do you think of my essay? What do you think of my privacy? Next time someone's trying to just say, no, you can't walk in my room, no, you can't do this, no, you can't that, no, you can't step over me. Are you going to assume they're hiding something or are you going to accept it? Maybe, just maybe, you really shouldn't be doing that. Even the lawyer said, if I'm not willing to let them look inside my bus, then I must be hiding something. Yeah, my privacy. There's nothing in my bus. In fact, I pack it for travel. I've shown it to you folks many times. I be <laughs> that was the funny thing. The first two people who came to my house were welcomed into the bus. One even was welcomed to take photographs and proud of the thing. Not the least bit. But the second one did it with such attitude. With such, just, oh my lord. He would ask me impertinent questions then interrupt the answer to bully me down, to tell me that I was lying, to tell me that I that he's he's not falling for it. He would stop me and say, No, you're not telling me the truth and I know it. What's the real story? Basically playing Inquisition officer with me. Um, over a minor complaint, which in fact was an unfounded complaint. And in fact has been found unfounded and yet we're still going round and round because I would not how. I would not go <laughs> sorry. No, I wrong. Oh, please don't punish me. You know, I didn't do all that stuff at him. And he was mad at me for that. And so he looks at me. How'd you like it if I set the bylaw officer on you, huh? And used her name, her first name, like... Again, I'm not, I'm not naming names in a video. Uh, let me make one up. Billy. How'd you like to meet Officer Billy, huh? Officer Billy, he's gonna come get you. Serious? I mean, he actually said it like that. How'd you like to meet Officer Billy then? Should I get Officer Billy on it? Hmm. Would you like that? And I was like, well, you know, at this point I was fully exasperated. I hadn't had a chance to explain much. Everything I had been explaining had been just dismissed. And the guy wasn't giving me anything concrete. At no point he said concretely, you should this or you should that. The only thing he said concretely was, if you take the bed out of your RV, then we won't say you're living there. But that's utterly unreasonable because it's not an RV without a bed. If I want to register it as an RV, it has to have a bed in it. But of course, I didn't get a chance to say that either because he was constantly cutting me off within two words. Then, 
this moron looking at my wood stove, which was running and working perfectly and not smoking, surrounded by slabs of stone and steel, which just a few touches with your hands would have shown me that nothing in the vicinity was overheating. But is the bone, the actual bone of contention? Everybody's upset about it because wood stoves mean fire and fire means scary and these are fire marshals and they freak out at the sight of fire. They don't, and for some reason nobody's bothered to teach them about wood stoves, which is really odd because there's a lot of them in this city and there's no law against them. In fact, they're, they're not even mentioned in city bylaws. Well, wood stoves aren't covered. Wood stoves are also not covered in, S in, 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 in the Saskatchewan traffic stuff. Wood stoves are not covered anywhere except through where you learn about wood stoves. You know, the shops, the stores, the policies, the recommendations, the citizen standards. But they are not legally covered by anything except uh, a building code. Building code has a section on how to install a wood stove in a house, not a bus. It's a bus. It's made of steel. Like, through the steel roof. Steel. I mean, like, steel doesn't catch fire, folks. Oh, this rant is getting much too long. Anyways, so he sicked the officer on me. I've got no reason to think that said officer is any more, is operating with me in good faith any more than the first fellow. I mean, so I'm taking a hard line with it. At the point that he, oh yeah, he stood there and he took out his camera. And he started to aim for a photograph. And I said, no, because he hadn't said, may I photograph it? If he'd said, do you mind if I photograph it? I said, sure, whatever. And that would have been the end of it. But he didn't ask. And I said, no, you may not take a picture. And I stood in front of him. And he tried to anyway. And I put my hands out. And I put them on his shoulders. And I started pushing. And I literally, five foot four me, hustled this five foot eleven man who used to be a firefighter, out the door. Go, out, 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 I said. You may not, I said. You have overstepped your bounds, I said. And that was the moment that I turned. That was the moment I decided, you know what? I am not bad again. This should not happen to anybody. If this happened to another person, it would have been permanently traumatic for them too. And they wouldn't have been able to fight back and he'd have gotten away with it. Just how many people has he treated like that and gotten away with it? So I've been raising a stink. I'm raising a stink on every level, at every level, to including having called the mayor, who is much too busy, and I knew that. And here's the thing, see. If there's nothing going on. There's nothing going on. Yeah. And all of this is just one crazy person. And that's what I want. And then the mayor doesn't need that. We don't need the mayor involved in nothing going on. We don't need the mayor involved at all. I don't need a lawyer for nothing going on. At this end, there's nothing going on. So, if something is going on, it's going on in the city. If there's corruption in this situation, as in using, gen using uh, city bylaws to push low-income people off of their homes in order to get the, the property for cheap so that you can develop it and make a profit, is indeed going on in this city. Gee. Then I think it's going to come up. I think it's going to show up. I think it's very important then for the mayor to keep an eye out for it and to have heard about it at least once. That at some point it's going to come up again and um, the city needs to fix it. That's not okay. That's just the kind of thing that really, really ruins lives. Um, when you take someone who's low income and you start laying fines on them for things that don't matter, okay, um, Bob has a house. Bob is a homeowner. Bob is messy. Bob doesn't clean up. Bob's hallways are trip hazards. Bob's railing on his deck is falling out. Bob lives alone and has no friends. Nobody comes over. He has no children or grandchildren. Who cares if a child might accidentally fall off the deck? Who cares if a partier might accidentally fall off the deck? Who cares if a group of people might get clustered in the hallway fleeing? There's one guy in the house who knows it like the back of his hand. Leave him alone. The only reason you have for hassling him on fire marshal, on fire marshal business is to take his home from him. Now, if you can prove that his home 
is leaking rats into neighboring homes, rats and mice and stuff. If you can, I mean, mere eyesore, as far as I'm concerned, is not a good enough reason. You need to step further. You need to show, you need to prove to me that what's going on inside that yard is leaking beyond the yard in more than simply the photons that reach your privileged little eyes. Because we gotta have a place to live. You can't just walk into poor neighborhoods where people have been living for years and decide that because it's cheap enough to develop, you're gonna kick them out and they've got nowhere to go. This is one of the lowest income neighborhoods in the city. There is no lower income neighborhood to turn to. What are they thinking? I mean, Bob is going to have no choice but to break the law just to get housed. Because Bob is an old pensioner. He's going to have no choice but to figure out what kind of law he can morally break. That he can, you know, square with his own morals and break that's hard enough to ensure that he gets into jail. Bob just might go, you know what? If I kill myself after I'm done, then I don't have to live with myself. And Bob just might become that, you know, random gunman. Joe's not going to. This Joe, this Joe might become a lawyer. This Joe will become a schooly person. This Joe might well one day drive into your town with a schooly with a sign on it says, Notary Public. I'm not sure. I'll have to look into it because it, it's a provincial thing. I may not be able to do it across Canada, so I might have to look into that. I might, might be stuck to practicing in Saskatchewan, or it might, it might be possible to get licensed in each province, respectively. That's so far in the future. I mean, I'm not even in law school. I haven't even, I'm not even ready to, to take the LSATs. But, uh, thank you for listening. I appreciate it.